so uh, tonight's theme is COVID-19 research and drug development at uh, SLU. Our speakers are Dr. John uh, Tavis and Amelia Pinto. Uh, John is a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at St. Louis University, and Amelia is an assistant professor in the same department. Uh, John's research focuses on antiviral drug development for hepatitis B. Uh, he is studying how the hepatitis B virus replicates in order to develop a new drug uh, that in combination with other medications could cure viral, the viral infection. So today, John will be telling us about challenges of drug development during the COVID-19 pandemic. So please take it away, John. Okay, um, and we can get started now. Um, so my topic is challenges of drug discovery during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a, a more of a general uh, topic is what I'm gonna be going through here. Um, I'm speaking now as the director of the St. Louis University Institute for Drug and Biotherapeutic Innovation. This does not reflect my, my research. Um, uh, you'll hear more about from a personal uh, perspective on research for COVID-19 from Amelia in a few moments. Um, uh, IDBI is a relatively newly formed uh, 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 distributive institute of drug discovery. There's 70 PIs and uh, senior investigators at St. Louis University uh, spread through uh, all of St. Louis University's campuses and um, you know, through a great number of our different departments that uh, work collaboratively to try and accelerate drug discovery and biotherapeutic uh, uh, development at uh, St. Louis University. If you have any questions about the Institute, uh, I'm the primary contact on that. Please feel free to send me an email. I'm not hard to find by Google. Okay, so I want to start out talking about key issues affecting uh, drug discovery. So just we know what all the topics are that we're going to go through here. Um, and uh, then I'll go through each of these topics individually, uh, how they relate to uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which got, is the pathogen that causes COVID-19, of course. Uh, and then the last topic, ethical aspects, is really a series of questions. Uh, and I'll go over some of the key issues of that. And Hopefully that will set off a few, a few questions from the audience to have a bit of a, a discussion going on. So that's my plan here. So the first one is how does the biology of SARS-CoV-2 affect its spread and drug discovery? First off, of course, is its infectiousness and route. Uh, this is a very highly infectious virus, primarily by viral, <clears throat> by respiratory droplets and, and then secondarily by fomites. Uh, so it can get all over fast, you know, which is uh, uh, indicated by how rapidly it exploded uh, across the world scene. Um, it comes, it is a zoonotic infection. It came from uh, um, uh, animals. The trace of the animal tr uh, develop, uh, evolution and transfer into um, humanity is not fully known yet, uh, but it is clearly a zoonotic infection. Actually, many of the uh, viruses that come out uh, causing pandemics are actually zoonotic in, or in origin, so this is not rare at all. However, very little is known about how the zoonotic aspect and, and, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 biology is going to affect the, how the pandemic plays out. You know, for example, it can infect great cats, but I don't think uh, the tigers are gonna really gonna be a major uh, uh, animal reservoir for them. And so, but as far as the, how this affects the uh, drug discovery is it raises the possibility there may be a market for veterinary SARS-CoV-2 drugs. I personally think that's going to be quite un unlikely, but it is possible and something to keep in the back of your mind if you're interested in drug discovery. The infection time course, of course, for this uh, uh, virus, it's moderately fast. It's slow, for example, relative to a, a norovirus, uh, and it's lightning fast compared to what I'm used to working with with hepatitis B virus. The key issue on here that affects drug discovery is that the infection does proceed slowly enough so that it is practical to diagnose the infection and start treating somebody before, uh, you know, early enough to have some therapeutic uh, benefit. My guess is, and early indications in the early clinical trials are indicating that the intervention window is likely to be about two weeks from primary infection, given the median uh, uh, onset of disease, uh, disease symptoms is typically around five days, although it can be much slower. That gives you a good window for therapeutic innovation. And in the clinical trials with uh, remdesivir, um, it, 
concurrent uh, treatment concurrent with diagnosis in the hospital was enough to uh, uh, yield clear evidence of therapeutic benefit to the patient. Lethality of, of this virus, uh, the case fatality rate is not known primarily because we don't really have an idea how many cases there are in the first place due to underdiagnosis and under detection. But it's clear that it's relatively low compared to other pandemic viruses, such as the 1918 flu viruses, uh, variola virus, which caused smallpox, Yersinia pestis, which caused the plague in the Middle Ages that killed a third of all human beings on, on the face of the earth. Yellow fever virus historically has had a 20 to 30% death rate once it got to its severe stages. So compared to uh, some of the pathogens that ma nailed humanity in the past, this one isn't so bad. Um, it is, however, the lethality is moderately high in hospitalized patients. And so that has uh, um, uh, uh, implications on drug design because that means that you can tolerate some side effects in the drugs and safety concerns in the drugs because you're dealing with something that is, is really got an urgent problem going on. Basically, we don't need to get a perfect drug the first time out. Um, we can tolerate uh, some, some problems with the drug. And for example, remdesivir has got some significant issues with it. Persistence in the human population, that's pretty much a black box right now. Um, if this behaves like a typical a respiratory infection, it is not going to be high at an individual level, but in the population level, it'll be quite high. Uh, susceptibility of the host population to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you have to break this into two parts. One is susceptibility to infection. That's very high, and that's due to a lack of herd immunity to an antigenetically distinct pathogen that's never been seen in the population before. This thing is ripping through a naive uh, population. Susceptibility disease uh, is different. It is moderate. Uh, it's clear that the large majority of the cases do not lead to serious disease. Uh, but the ratio of asymptomatic to symptomatic cases is, it, we really don't know. Um, but the susceptibility to disease and the susceptibility of infection combined indicate this is going to have a huge market size, which of course inf influences how drug companies look at uh, uh, distributing their, um, uh, their resources in development. Uh, there is a serious variability in disease incidence per infection. Uh, it's extremely poorly understood. It's affected by host genetics, immune state, diet, comorbidities, phase of the moon, Lord knows what else. Um, you know, shoe size might fit in this. We really don't know. Um, and so that, of course, if it, it raises serious uh, uh, question marks in clinical trial design and the potential of uh, uh, designing personalized treatments for those people who are, are most at need of it. Um, so that's a complexity you have to deal with. Durability of post-infection immunity. I don't think I'm the only person in the world who really, really, really wants to know what that is. It is unknown at this point. There is probably some post-infection immunity once you clear the infection. Obviously, your immune system's one in the first place, so it's capable of doing it. But we really don't know what it is, and this has a major impact on the shape of the pandemic, which in, in turn affects has major impacts on the durability and size of the market for a drug, uh, which is something that the drug companies pay uh, exquisitely close attention to. So disease manifestations affecting drug discovery. Um, the diagnostic value of early symptoms can be really valuable. That was really, really important, uh, for example, in clearance of the smallpox pan uh, ep uh, pandemic and driving the virus to extinction. Here, it's really low. I don't know how many times I described symptoms of a viral infection to the med, school, med students during the lectures as, quote, flu-like. Um, and so it's really got a low early diagnostic uh, value just from the symptoms. That clearly mandates development of very rapid molecular tests for accurate diagnosis and treatment monitoring, uh, preferably point of care. There's an awful lot of work going on in that area. There's been some very, very good advances in that area, but we really aren't where we need to be yet. So there's plenty more room for those of you who love uh, developing assay uh, kits and tests, uh, uh, you know, dive in and go for it. The major pathogenic symptoms, uh, of course, the ones at least leading to death are primary viral uh, pneumonia, and that uh, ha uh, mandates uh, drug formulation delivery to the lungs. Um, that doesn't mean that's the only place you want that drug to get, but it means it does have to get there. 
um, and it may, of course, permit symptom uh, development of symptom targeting drugs. Um, you know, if you can keep the patient alive by just uh, um, keeping the symptoms under control so that you can uh, allow the patient's immune system to do the heavy lifting, well, that's good too. Um, and then, of course, timing of infectivity onset relative to symptom onset is always a big issue in the spread of pathogens in a population. In SARS-CoV-2, it's clear that infectivity can precede symptoms in many cases, allows asymptomatic spread, and really complicates control by quarantine, which, of course, increases the need for uh, vaccines and, and drugs. And this also, of course, may open a market for prophylactic drugs in high-risk population, like, for example, our uh, colleagues in the infectious disease wards. Um, but however, it, prophylactic drug use mandates that the drug be really, really safe, and that we know for sure it be really, really safe. And it's going to take a while for the clinical experience with the new drugs to come to the point where we can really be comfortable with prophylactic use, although there is clearly a market for it, at least until the vaccine comes along. Um, geographical distribution of SARS-CoV-2 is affecting the shape of the pandemic. Uh, the initial de uh, detection was found in Wuhan, which is a modern city with an adequate scientific medical infrastructure. I actually have been there. I've given a lecture at their largest infectious diseases hospital. Uh, it isn't quite up to uh, the standards of the, the SLU or the WashU hospitals, but you're a long way from up being out in the middle of nowhere. That clearly permitted early identification. Politically, some of that value was squandered, as we all know from uh, uh, following the news. However, it did give time for uh, uh, us to begin drug development efforts very early. The same thing goes for vaccine development efforts. And fortunately, the research community didn't mess up as badly as the political community did. Um, so there's uh, right from it when it became apparent that this virus was gonna be a problem, um, a lot of companies and a lot of academics started diving in and diving in hard trying to, uh, trying to get this uh, going. So we got a leg up on it. Uh, and of course, early penetration of the pathogen into developed areas such as Wuhan provided researchers with good and rapid access to patients and samples. That is, of course, always an asset. For example, the SARS-CoV-2 genome was published lickety split in basically no time at all which was obviously very, very useful for a number of things. Um, however, the flip side of that is rapid penetration to areas of major research expertise, such as the New York City area, uh, has hampered development by slowing down the ability of the researchers uh, to do their job. Market location is really, really important. This one's worldwide, basically everywhere. Uh, so the first world uh, uh, markets can afford drugs. That's really important in the calculus of the drug companies because they need to be able to make their money back from their developmental efforts. Lower income countries are gonna need cost adjustments and or governmental purchases in order to make, uh, the, the, make the impact that we know we need to make. And a big issue is IP protection in lower income countries it's, is at serious risk due to the extreme urgent need uh, that those countries have which of course has major financial implications on how this is gonna play out and what the pricing uh, um, uh, spectrum is likely to look like. Okay, state of preparedness for SARS-CoV-2 is also a really important topic. Relationship to known pathogens, that's a big one. SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, I should have a two there, sorry, uh, messed up there, uh, it's a typo. Uh, is very similar to the seasonal uh, coronaviruses, MERS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus at the big picture. I mean, it's a coronavirus. We know stuff about coronaviruses already. We'd love to know an awful lot more to get to the nauseating level of detail that's needed for uh, drug discovery, but we're not working from a completely blank book, okay? We know what a coronavirus looks like and how it works. Um, repurposing existing drugs or drug candidates is absolutely essential for early uh, success. Drug and vaccine development clinical trials, related pathogens really laid the groundwork for rapid drug development. Remdesivir, for example, is in clinical trials for Ebola virus. Uh, Favipiravir, and I'm always really bad at pronouncing that, uh, is an approved drug in uh, Japan for um, uh, um, for influenza virus. 
And so these are the two leading drugs. Uh, uh, remdesivir is, has shown some clinical benefit. It's not where we want it to be yet, but it's got some clinical benefit. And that uh, was able to be done that quickly because the safety studies were already done. We knew how to dose it. We knew what the human doses needed to be. So we could uh, move uh, almost instantaneously into a, uh, into a clinical trial, one of which was run at, uh, one arm of which was run at St. Louis University. And I noticed when logging on that the local uh, PI of that, Dr. Sarah George, uh, is one of the attendees at this, uh, at this webinar. Um, without such hypothesis-driven repurposing, new dr drug discoveries got to start from scratch, which means we're not going to get anything quickly. Um, you know, the average time of development from a concept to first sale is about 10 years. And obviously, we don't have 10 years right now. We've got to move faster than that. So that means repurposing is the name of the game. Funding for drug development for emerging pathogens always stinks um, until an outbreak hits. And then money gets poured on it like crazy, and then it dries up immediately afterwards. SARS-CoV-1, uh, which caused, I believe, what was it, the 2002 uh, epidemic? Uh, is a good example of that. Um, you know, a whole bunch of money got dumped into it and then it dried up. Um, that's likely to be what's going to happen here also. Um, fortunately, however, SARS-CoV-2 drug development and vaccine development, by the way, falls in the same category, has benefited absolutely tremendously, enormously, bigly, uh, hugely, however, whichever adjective you want to use, uh, from the investments in the SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV uh, uh, emerging viruses. Um, you know, cl uh, we have clinical trials going on right now of vaccines against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and those, we couldn't have gotten anywhere near that area if we hadn't had vaccine candidates for SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. And so uh, rapid allocation of government and corporate funds for drug discovery is enabling rapid progress, and that really is, there is an enormous amount of very rapid progress going on. So finally, the last slide I have here, um, and this is more to get people thinking more than uh, to say that I know all the ethical answers, because I don't, um, but under drug trials, I mean, how do we accelerate the trials uh, safely? I mean, adaptive trial designs, we've got to really rock things along here. But how do you design a control arm when you're dealing with a deadly disease for which there are no treatments? How can you manage compassionate use? You want to do it on one hand, but it messes up your data for determining whether or not the drug is working properly, uh, and it can confuse the messaging into the population, and that has been clearly a problem for us here with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, when is a challenge trial ethically permissible? Um, you know, challenge trials really move it along pretty quickly, but ethically giving somebody an infection with a lethal virus when there's no treatment for it even in low-risk populations, has got huge problems with it. There's been something like 14,000 people who've volunteered for a challenge vaccine trial already, but getting that past an IRB is not going to be easy. That will get much easier for vaccines if it turns out that some of these repurposed drugs that are being tried actually have some decent efficacy, better than remdesivir. Uh, regulatory control, this is a huge issue. Uh, you know, how flexible and responsible is, responsive is the regulatory agent? How, how can intellectual property be protected? You got to be able to get the enormous amount of money being dumped into drug and vaccine development back. And how overlapping and fragmented is the regulatory landscape? And the answer is it's very fragmented on the world stage. Distribution, big, big questions. Why don't you watch uh, 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 the movie uh, um, uh, Contagion? You get a really good uh, sense of the complexities of deciding who gets the drug first, who decides who gets it. What's your goal? Are you trying to control it locally, regionally, nationally? I mean, the rise of nationalism is getting, pe getting people saying, I want this, this is all for mine, but we really need an international treatment capacity. Who goes about delivering it? These are just nasty, nasty questions. Pricing, who pays? Uh, how does the company recover its costs without appearing to be a vampire? There's already been blowback on Gilead over remdesivir over its pricing. Um, uh, you know, how is the pricing determined? How variable is it? And what special populations need special uh, financial considerations? Uh, so these are all really big, big, knotty questions. So with those questions for which I do not have answers, I will end. 
and uh, take any questions if anybody would like to uh, chime in. Well, thank you very much, John. And very interesting talk. And I'm sorry to hear that you don't have answers to those ethical questions. Uh, but we'll open it now to questions from the audience. So people are a little shy uh, often. <laughs> And so uh, just to get started, I wondered uh, some of these issues that you raised earlier about, uh, about uh, repurposing uh, other drugs. Do you expect that to be highly successful or uh, how rapidly do you expect that to be modified something that, um, that already Well, exists? I don't play the, uh, the lottery and being able to predict the outcome of, uh, you know, the, the lottery ball drops is about as good as uh, you can do here. Until we get to clinical trials, it's hard to say. What I can say is basic biology says that we know what types of drugs you'd like to deal with. I mean, an entry inhibitor, for example, that binds to the, the receptor, uh, both from Desivir and Feather. And again, I apologize for the massive mispronunciation. I see Amelia's uh, laughing at me. Um, <laughs> um, uh, those are both uh, RNA-directed RNA, RNA polymerase uh, inhibitors. There's a good uh, track record uh, for RDRP inhibitors uh, in uh, clinical trials and in approvals, for example, sofosprevir against uh, uh, hepatitis C virus is a, an extraordinarily effective drug and it works by the same mechanism. Um, you know, uh, basically any of the essential viral enzymes are obvious targets. Uh, and so, you know, we have, we're not, we're not running completely blind. We know which sandboxes to play in, but those are big sandboxes. Oh, and we have somebody who's raised his hand. So, Andrew? Yeah, uh, I was wondering about the drugs. What about like using the flu antiviral drugs and the HIV antiviral drugs? Are those of any possible use? Well, the, the HIV ones are probably not. HIV is a reverse transcribing virus um, and its pathology is very different. Um, the cell types it gets into are largely very different. Uh, so I was really surprised when they started talking about them. This, the limited trial data that I've seen, the uh, HIV drugs that have been tested uh, flopped miserably. Uh, for flu, you've got a different topic going on here. Flu uh, causes similar pathology, infects similar tissues, uh, has a similar overall cellular uh, and viral replication cycle. And so their uh, drugs like uh, Favipivir, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, they, they actually have a decent chance. And if they have a pivivir, and again, I apologize for killing the name, uh, it works really, really well in cell culture. Okay, so it clearly works against the virus. The question is whether or not it's going to get where it needs to be in the body fast enough and at a high enough concentration to do what it needs to get done. Um, that we don't know and only clinical trials can say. Oh, the other uh, flu drugs, no. They work by flu-specific mechanisms. So no, you're not gonna have uh, Tamiflu working against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So uh, Amelia uh, focuses, uh, her research focuses on arboviruses using animal models to understand disease progression and to evaluate vaccines and treatments with particular interest in the role of cytokines in a protective immune response. Uh, she's working with the SLU Center for Vaccine and Treatment Evaluation Unit to understand uh, viral infection pathogenesis and immunity in both healthy and at-risk populations and is uh, participating in the ongoing remdesivir trial at SLU. So, uh, Amelia, please tell us about your COVID-19 research. <laughs> sure. All right. Let's see if I can share screens. Uh, got a lot of desktops to choose from here. Um, all right, and then let's see if this will work. Have that work out for it. Does that work? Okay. Yep, works for me. So uh, I started here at SLU in 2015. Um, and shortly after starting here, 
um, I started to work on a, a, a compound screening trial for SARS, the original, um, which I think is what uh, elevated me to expertise in this field. Um, I have to be honest, I have never given a presentation on data that I have spent so little time on prior to giving this talk. Um, usually it's many years that I've studied these pathogens, but in this case, um, here we go. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is first setting up the model of how, what I view as our traditional way of approaching um, the research at St. Louis University um, and how it goes to support the vaccine treatment and evaluation unit and what we do independent of the VTEUs as well as with the VTEUs. So SLU is one of nine VTEU sites um, throughout the country and um, they evaluate uh, NIH-sponsored vaccine trials. Um, Sarah George, who is on the, on the phone call, can speak more to the VTU and its, its background, but um, ours here at SLU is run by Dan Hoft and his group. Um, and usually what I would say is the general contributing factors for research in this is for the assay development for pathogens, diagnostic testing for pathogens, and developing of these preclinical animal models so that we can try out different vaccines and whatnot, which then brings us to the vaccine trials. Now, with SARS-CoV-2 um, and the COVID-19 research, this model that I think that we've been operating on has been completely turned around. Um, it really did start um, mostly with the VTUs and with the vaccine trials coming, or I'm sorry, the, the treatment trials coming here. Um, and from that, we've been working to develop diagnostics, assay developments, and hopefully in the last part of my talk, I'll talk a little bit about the preclinical animal model trials that we have, or the op models that we have developing here at SLU. But, um, to say that this is backwards is an understatement. Um, normally, as John has spoke to, we are much more into the development of these pathogens and understanding the pathogen and pathogenesis and the drugs prior to going into human clinical trials. Um, and in this case, um, this is completely backwards. So when we talk about the um, the remdesivir trial, and I laugh only because I am as miserable at pronouncing these compounds and these drugs as John is. Um, not that I have any skill at it, but please bear with me. Um, so the trial, um, which is a part of the VTU, but is also um, being run at multiple institutions outside of these VTUs, is the Adapted COVID-19 Treatment Trial, or ACT. Um, this trial is being headed by Sarah George here, um, who's the PI. It began on February 21st, and it actually closed the first trial on April 19th of this year. And when I say began, I mean began enrolling. So um, as John spoke to, remdesivir, um, it's an, excuse me, it's a nucleoside triphosphate analog. Um, and I'm gonna give you some basic backgrounds on this drug screen, or um, excuse me, on this trial and how it was set up and then go into a little bit more of how the research here at SLU has supported this trial. So to start with, um, to be enrolled in the trial, the subjects were screened and found to be quantitative RT-PCR positive prior to enrollment. Um, and then in the initial trial, um, subjects were randomized and either received and received this high dose remdesivir followed by maintenance dose for two to 10 days, um, or they were on a placebo. Um, samples were collected intermittently for post, um, during hospitalization and post hospitalization if possible. All non-safety samples that um, are collected for these trials are sent to DMID, um, which is um, where their, their repository, where those samples are stored. And for research purposes and for analysis of these samples, um, the VTUs are awarded sites to, or the ability to receive those samples back and analyze them to determine efficacy as well as um, other research value um, from these samples. So there is a remdesivir trial going on now. It's called ACT-2. Um, it began enrolling on May 5th, and you would have to speak to Sarah as far as the level of enrollment that's currently going on. So this trial had, and here's another one of those fun drugs, the addition of barcitinib, um, which is from Eli Lilly. 
It's a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor um, with approvals in more than 65 countries um, for treating rheumatoid arthritis. So this is an anti-inflammatory and it's supposed to act or thought to act um, in, for the inflammatory cascade for COVID-19. So if you think about it as far as um, remdesivir is targeting the virus or SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the varsinib is more targeting COVID-19, so the disease aspects of the virus, uh, rather than the virus itself. So th this new trial is targeting both, in this case, very similar to the first um, subjects had to be RT-PCR positive in order to be enrolled. Um, everybody, however, gets remdesivir um, and only a portion will receive the varsinib orally while others will get placebo. So in this study, um, we're really, uh, we've moved past the efficacy of the first drug and we're looking at the shortness and duration of disease with the second. So, how did the researchers at SLU support this and are continuing to support this? And you'll forgive me the analogy, but it was just too easy. Um, but I promise you, I will only speak of this in the acts in this slide. Um, so we have, what is the prologue, which is prior to beginning these trials, there needs to be biosafety protocols, IBCs and IRBs. As many of us researchers here at SLU had previously worked on SARS, we did play a decent role in participating in the development of those IBCs and in uh, conversations about the IRBs. Um, we also worked uh, closely to help with the development of and continuing to develop diagnostic assays to confirm SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and what I this third point here about development of protocols for sample collection and useful time points for efficacy and research evaluation. Not so much in this trial as this is much more of a national trial, but normally for the VTEU trials that we've been involved in, um, the research aspects or the research arms of, of SLU do um, contribute to the development of these protocols so that we can pick the times where we feel that the viral titers would be the lowest or the, infl or the immune responses would be the highest. So we contribute to when you would um, take patient samples and what types of samples to take. In this study, as it was more of a national study, I think that our institution, as well as multiple others, had lots of input that was then, and rightfully so, summarily ignored um, <laughs> as patient evaluation came far before our research interests. So in this intermission that was between Act 1 and Act 2, traditionally, I would say that the research aspects of SLU, we come in and we talk about the protocol revisions, any sort of new tools for diagnostics, um, reevaluating when samples should be taken. In this case, again, um, I, there was very little um, that research played in the development of the new ACT trials. Um, we really are just here to support any work that's being done. And finally, what I would say is the epilogue, which is yet to be written. Now, I spoke of those samples that are being collected and stored um, in the repository. So in order for researchers like myself and others to gain access to those, we write proposals and we submit those proposals to um, obtain re those research samples from the trial. Again, these samples are quite um, valuable and certainly for efficacy cases, um, those are going to take priority, but um, we are actively thinking about and writing these proposals for what we can do with the samples when these trials are done. So second to that, um, and in conjunction with the studies going on at the VTU as well as separately um, outside of the VTU, how the research at SLU has um, worked to understand this disease is that uh, we first began looking for what were the initial needs. And as John spoke about um, this being a new emerging infection, those initial needs really fell to questions of detection um, for both exposed and infected. So in this case, have you had SARS-CoV-2 before and do you have an immune response to it? Do you currently have the infection? Um, and again, I will say that this virus is quite different from what we've previously worked on because what you would normally do is develop the assays to determine if people had been exposed. So the immunological responses, the antibody detection assays, the ELISA assays. Um, 
and secondary to that, look at the peak viral titers and those currently infected. Um, in this case, uh, we're working again backwards, um, where the quantitative PCR assays for viral infection and act active viral replication were certainly developed first, and the ELISAs were developed um, after. However, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ELISAs first. Um, so the ELISA is the assay in which we use to detect whether or not you have antibodies um, in response to the pathogen. Um, and here at SLU, one of the first questions that uh, people came to us, uh, companies came to us and asked, is which viral protein should they target? Um, and this is not actually a very small or insignificant question. So on what I guess is the left of the screen, we're talking about what the virus looks like itself. And um, the viral protein that we would target uh, most likely would be the spike protein or this S protein. And so when you look at the spike protein, what it is is actually two subunits, with subunit one and subunit two, um, which also has a receptor binding domain in it. And if you think about developing assays, a high throughput assay that can be um, rolled out pretty much throughout the world, what you want is to be able to make a protein which has to be folded properly for an antibody to recognize it in a fast rapid quantity. So what we were asked by multiple different companies was, how much of this spike protein do we need to make? Do we need to make the whole spike protein? Could we make just subunit one, subunit two? Which part is important to us um, for developing these assays? So what happened was um, we paired ourselves with uh, multiple different companies, both in St. Louis and outside of St. Louis, who provided uh, multiple, our, our research, my research group and a few other research groups here with milligram quantities of either this subunit one protein, subunit two, or just the receptor binding protein. And I should say that the receptor binding binds to the receptor, the human receptor, uh, human ACE2, and that'll come into play a little bit later. And so what we did was we ran ELISAs. So we coded plates with these different proteins that we were provided and determined from hum um, SARS-CoV-2 positive human serum, how you know, which one of these proteins was best for recognition. Um, to be honest, we provided this data. Um, we did not make the final determinations for these ELISAs. This would be what will be the next generation of ELISAs that are going to be rolled out for detection. The current ones are not as sensitive as these assays are. Um, but they are a bit easier to make the protein than uh, what they provided us here. And for me, um, as a researcher at SLU, one of the nice secondary aspects of this is now I have what is a great deal of protein from these different parts of the subunit of spike, which I can then develop my own research program on and start to understand what parts of spike are important um, for the virus and viral entry. So, Second to that is detection of the virus, um, and this is detection of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this is detection of um, the viral RNA, which is the assay that um, was the first one to really come out. So way back, and I guess this was probably early February when we set up this assay, and I'm showing you probably one of the second or third iterations of this assay. Um, what we set out to do was to determine whether or not the CDC guidelines for how to detect SARS-CoV-2, how to set up that assay and how to run that assay. So that's what this is here. And what I'm showing you here is the real-time PCR data for the detection that was set up and run as uh, the guidelines for the CDC um, proposed. Um, and what we noticed as researchers was that the, so what we're looking at here is the red and green line, as well as the blue line are the positive controls. And this assay is not very sensitive. Um, and so what we're currently working on now is the next generation of this assay to improve its sensitivity, to um, allow a more uh, sensitive limit of detection for this, so that to avoid uh, false negative detection. Um, using this quantitative PCR reaction that the CDC has uh, proposed for screening. And then uh, the next thing I'll talk about is really what I would say my lab and what uh, a few other labs at, at SLU have been spending a fair amount of their time on, which is infectious virus quantification. 
Um, why you'd want this is it is really um, what is required for understanding antibody neutralization for vaccine development. So when we talk about getting a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, that vaccine test, one of the first criteria in order to be considered a vaccine is its ability to neutralize virus. And so you have to be able to grow the virus, detect the virus in order to determine whether or not you can neutralize it. Um, you also, I think probably again around February, maybe early March, when people were starting to question about the people who had the infection and were testing positive, how long, if they could detect RNA out um, 20, 30 days later, were they still infectious? So they were detecting RNA by these QRT-PCR reactions, but it was curious as to whether or not they could come back to work, whether or not they were spreading disease. And so we've been working to develop these infectious virus assays to answer the question as to whether or not, if you can detect the viral RNA, does that mean that you have infectious virus? Um, this assay is also critically important for all the compound screenings for antivirals and therapeutics that uh, everybody is very interested in developing to be able to find out whether or not in the preclinical animal models or in in vitro tests, um, your ha uh, compound of interest has an impact on viral replication, you need to be able to detect the virus. This also, um, and certainly John can speak to this um, as well, having an ability to detect infectious virus makes viral research much, much easier. You can start looking at pathogenesis and disease models when you're able to detect infectious virus. The huge caveat to this, however, is that this is the part of research where you have to switch from doing bench research. So all this stuff that I've talked about previously as far as the research at SLU can be done in a BSL-2 laboratory on a bench top. Once we get into detection of infectious virus and growing infectious virus, that's when you switch to your hoods and your PAPR and having to um, much more restrict access to the pathogen. So there is a huge trade-off to this. Um, it does restrict the number of researchers who are doing this work um, to a very select few of us. Um, hopefully we'll have more in the coming weeks, um, but that is uh, where we, where this is the big turning point between the lab, laboratory work, and then detecting infectious virus. So um, we are able to detect infectious virus. Um, it's kind of a bit hard to see here, but what you're looking at are two 96 well plates. Um, they're plated with cells, and every time you see a little blue spot that um, in one of the wells, that is infectious SARS-CoV-2. I do have to say that this was an assay that one of my graduate students had set up to determine cell concentration that was best for detecting virus. And I kind of commandeered it to spell words, um, which she quite enjoyed. Um, and, and it does make me quite happy when I see it. Um, but we were developing what were the best diagnostic assay or what was the best assay for detecting a virus. And it does seem to work and it works quite well. So now that we're able to um, and detect this infectious virus, and this was, oh gosh, about a month ago now, again, very rapidly turning this stuff around, we have been um, able to uh, develop what are neutralization assays. So this is where we're talking about this gold standard of whether or not human immune responses can neutralize or block viral infection. And what I'm showing you is just one assay um, that was completed of couple of weeks ago now um, with human serum samples from all over the world right now um, where we were looking to determine if they were quantitative PCR positive whether or not they could neutralize virus um, and the good news is the vast majority um, save one so far of uh, people who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 um, after a period of about 30 days had developed antibodies which can neutralize the virus so that's a big, big positive, and it's a big win for us as far as being able to go further and determine what parts of the virus are these neutralizing antibodies detecting and um, how can we develop a better vaccine which induces these types of neutralizing antibody responses so that we can look to the people who have not been exposed to develop these responses as well. And so quickly for my last slide, um, I'm going to talk just a bit about where we are on small animal model development for preclinical evaluation. 
Um, really here, uh, we've got two main small animals that we're working with, um, hamster models. So hamsters have been shown to be very susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, um, which makes them a very nice model for studying disease. However, um, on the, when I put on my immunological hat, this is not an ideal model as there aren't a lot of reagents available for studying any disease in hamsters. It makes it a bit more challenging um, to work with. We'd much prefer to work with mice where we have many, many more genetic materials available and, and variations in the mice. Um, there are transgenic mice that express the human ACE2 and whatnot because mice naturally aren't susceptible. Um, the other way in which we're working to make these mice susceptible is to transfect in mRNA expressing the human ACE2, um, which we've been able to show does make the mice more susceptible to disease. Um, I should also say that we are collaborating with uh, the Jackson Laboratories, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, who have humanized mouse models um, to look to see how susceptible those models are um, to SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we've, we're starting to get some interesting data, um, but we can certainly use more researchers and more hands on all of that because it's, it's quite a lot of work and, and we're, we're working our way through it. So with that, I will end with again, what is my favorite focus forming assay plate ever? Um, and along with John, take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Amelia. So, um, and thanks again, John. We've got about, um, five minutes before we have to vacate the room. So if people could ask any questions, I see there has been some chat back and forth um, with, with John about some questions. Oh, and so Ranjit has, uh, has a question. Go ahead. Oop, sorry. You didn't get unmuted. I'm having trouble unmuting. There you go. Try again, Ranji. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay. So I want to uh, just ask a question regarding the asymptomatic cases and the the possible latency period this virus might go. And as John has mentioned about the uh, persistence, there is it's a complete black box. Nobody knows how long. Uh, it's going to stay and uh, maybe later on, depending on the immunity as well as aging, it might reactivate. So uh, uh, as you are into this, uh, this viruses, so how, how, what is the probability or possibility that uh, this virus may integrate? And are there any ways, uh, because it's a very complicated thing, so are there any efforts into the, that direction? The, the probability of it integrating is very close to zero. This is an RNA virus. It would have to be spuriously reverse transcribed into DNA uh, in order to uh, be integrated into the viral genome. There are molecular fossils of RNA viruses in many mammalian, including human genomes, uh, but those occur rarely, uh, even on the scale of evolutionary time. So the probability of this uh, uh, causing a direct integrational mutagenesis in a human patient is exceptionally low, almost to zero. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think there's a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, thank you. So. Um, it said, uh, this is from Andrew, and it said, what are the false positive and false negative rates for current commercial um, QRT-PCR tests? Mm -hmm. Well, I can say it's pretty hard to know. Um, you know that there are some reports that put it up at around 40% and others that put it at 10 um, it, it, or, or below 10. Um, what I can say for the QRT-PCR is, um, I'm not sure how many people have done that assay, but the, those CT values or the point at which you detect replication is very high, and which means that 
you're at you're at very close to where levels of contamination are. Um, so it, it is uh, it is very challenging to look at that assay and say it's optimized. Um, so there it's a little unclear right now as to who you know what the levels of false positive and false negative are, but it is definitely clear that these assays are uh, rolled out for a pandemic and not optimized yet for uh, the level of detection that we would normally um, develop for something like this. The only thing I can add to that is the false negatives are also um, contributed by sampling errors. Uh, you really have to stick those uh, uh, swabs up somebody's uh, nose really far. I've heard people joking about, about scratching the back of their eyeballs. Um, and it's uncomfortable and difficult to do. So there is there is a false negative rate due to sampling errors in addition to the inherent limitations of the assay that, that uh, uh, Amelia just mentioned. So we had two other quick questions. One is just uh, sensitivity of RT-PCR and are there testing labs in the US using the QR uh, T PCR based on spike encoding genes? Not via the CDC approved protocol. The CDC approved protocol requires the nucleoprotein uh, as uh, those primer probe sets that detect the nucleoprotein as the protein that needs to, that they have to run in order to determine positive versus negative. Now, that's not to say that there aren't other assays. Certainly, we have other assays which we've been. Um, tweaking to see if we can get a more sensitive test. But right now, um, for detection, as much as I know, and, and certainly others could speak to this, but I, you know, I checked the CDC website uh, last week, and I believe that they are still sticking with the same uh, QRT-PCR assay for detection. Theoretical level, you can make QRT-PCR <laughs> tests incredibly sensitive. Um, I believe, although I can't absolutely prove it, that I've uh, had a hepatitis C virus RNA uh, detection system in my lab at one time that was capable of detecting single digit number of copy, uh, copies of RNA molecules. It's capable of doing that, the current ones aren't there, as Amelia has discussed. So I think we have time just for one last question before we go. So Yulia has asked if there's a correlation between the number of virus and the ability to infect. We don't know yet. Um, what we have seen is correlation with uh, the quality of the response and their ability to neutralize virus, um, but the amount of virus um, and any aspect that way, um, we're not there yet. And that most has a lot to do with um, really trying not to interrupt uh, standard of care. Um, I, I could think of hundreds of things I would like to do, um, but there is no way I'm going to walk over to a clinician and ask them um, <laughs> to have these samples right now when in the position that they're in. So um, we're, we're looking very closely at levels of virus. It certainly seems that there are different levels of virus in different individuals, whether or not that contributes to spread. Um, we just don't know. Um, it, it is interesting because there is definitely variation in viral, le in viral loads in different individuals. So I think we're out of time. We have to make way for the next talk uh, next session. But thank you again, both to uh, Amelia and to John. And I think people, they'd be happy to have you email them with further questions if you want to continue afterwards. Certainly. So thank you once again. Thanks.